Welcome to the Redemptive Economics Podcast, where we are empowering Christian entrepreneurs to make a redemptive economic impact here in Pittsburgh and beyond. Let's get to work! Hey guys, welcome back to the show. I am your host, Mike Hatch, and today we are going to focus in on principle number two under the category pulling it up here so I have it, aligning with God's redemptive plan. Principle number two is created in the image of God. People are the most valuable assets worth infinitely more than any other capital. Christians are the wealth or store of value in God's kingdom. Now, We'll, I'm going to elaborate more on that here in just a bit and talk about the distinction I made there between just people in general and Christians. And if you've been listening to the show up to this point, I think you have some idea of where I'm going with that. But in the episode that dropped this last Monday, the interview we did with Tamara Bay, if you didn't check it out, check it out. Amazing interview and an incredible story of God's sovereignty and grace and mercy and something, man, I think we all as entrepreneurs can take away value from. Tamara, as we were talking, had said that she thought that success was going to look, in, in this new entrepreneurial venture, was going to look a lot like what it did when she was in the corporate world. It was all about achieving the KPIs and closing deals and making money, right? Instead, what she found out, and I'm kind of paraphrasing, was the value of relationships over KPIs. Because she described how the process that it it, that God has brought her through with this business has been more about the impact that she's having in these people's lives that she's getting to work with who own these businesses or nonprofit leaders, etc. Getting to pray with them, getting to share Christ with them, and just be the hands and feet of Jesus in their lives. I don't think she was thinking about that initially when she got started. And, and this is, you know, so many of us as we get started in our entrepreneurial journey, have all sorts of visions of success and wealth and prosperity. But often, as she said in the interview, and, and of course, I, I absolutely agree with her, su the success that we think we're going to have isn't always the success that God has for us or is not, is not the way that God would define success. Sometimes we just assume, you know, when we talk about the fact that where God calls, he's going to provide. And I think often we think that that's going to happen materially or financially, and that's not always the case. Sometimes he needs to provide in terms of refining your faith, growing your character. Those are, are things that, uh, that are so much more important and have an eternal impact on what God is doing in your life. So I want to look at a passage of scripture, Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 to 22, to kind of illustrate this second principle. Now in this scripture, Jesus is interacting with the Pharisees, and it says in verse 15 that the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Of course, they're blowing smoke here, and they go on to say, you aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. In other words, they're kind of saying, we know you don't care about what other people think. They're kind of like paying false homage to his impartiality. So they're kind of trying to butter him up. And so here comes the punchline. Verse 17, tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar? Or not. Now, this question was fraught with landmines because, from a religious perspective, the, the, the Hebrew religious perspective, they, of course, felt like it was wrong and believed it was wrong to be paying taxes to Caesar. But unfortunately, under the threat of force, they had to pay this tax, this money, to Caesar. What's ironic about this is that the taxes that were being paid that were going to Caesar, the Pharisees and the religious leaders were absolutely skimming off the top and, and stealing a lot of that money for themselves. So it's kind of interesting that they're asking this question, which is part of the reason why Jesus responds in verse 18 when he says, he says no, or it says, knowing their evil intent, he said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Well, they're hypocrites because... Look, they were benefiting from that tax that was paid to Caesar. 
In fact, there is a treasury under the temple filled with gold and silver that the religious leaders were hoarding and stockpiling from what they had stolen from their own people. So they were just as guilty as the Roman political leaders. Jeff Doherty with Allstate Insurance has the distinction of being the very first sponsor of the Redemptive Economics podcast, and I couldn't be happier to promote his services. I've known Jeff for many years now, both as his pastor and friend, and man, I can say with confidence that he is a man of strong faith who aligns well with the Redemptive Economics values. So reach out to Jeff. He can offer you options for a wide variety of coverage and services. He's committed to helping Pittsburgh residents assess their immediate and long-term needs and choose options that will help you achieve your goals. When you want to explore options for protecting your home, personal property, or financial future, Jeff Doherty is your guy. You'll find Jeff's contact information in the show notes. Hey, go grab a cup of coffee with him, get to know him, even if it's just to review your current coverage in case you need to make adjustments. And I promise you're going to love Jeff every bit as much as I do. They also trapped him by virtue of the very question itself, because how Jesus answered in their minds, either way, would lead him to being, well, accomplish what they were trying to do, which was to trap him, arrest him, and kill him. And so if he answered that the that they shouldn't be paying taxes to Caesar, then they would have the ability to turn him over to Caesar as someone who was denying Caesar's authority. If he answered and told them, no, we need to be paying taxes to Caesar, then he would be denying the Torah, the Old Testament law, and be subject to the Jewish religious authority to be, again, trapped, imprisoned, and possibly put to death. But here's the genius of what Jesus does. His response, like so many others throughout the Gospels, is amazing. So it says in, in verse 18, again, I'll start from the beginning, but Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius and he asked them, whose image is this and whose inscription? So of course he's taking the coin and the image on the coin was Caesar's. And they answer that in the affirmative in verse 21, they say it's Caesar's, they replied. And of course, his inscription around it as well. And so the image of Caesar was imprinted on this coin that they were to be paying back to him as a tax. It says in the rest of verse 21, then he said to them, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. <laughs> he just turned it around and basically trapped them in their own trap in a sense. And it says in verse 22, when they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. Of course, they were amazed and they were kind of thwarted. Their plan was thwarted and they went back to conniving again to try to figure out another way to trap Jesus. Now, what I love about this passage is that what Jesus teaches here through this interaction with the Pharisees is so much deeper than just what, it, what you read on the surface. And in essence, we can only look back after Jesus has died, given his life, been raised from the dead and now has empowered us by the Holy Spirit, we can look back with context and perspective and understand the deeper meaning to what he was saying here. And it is profound. So basically you have Caesar who in a sense is like the rich fool because Caesar is laying claim to this coin, even stamping his image on it, which was most likely a, a silver coin. He stamped his image on it as if he, it was his, it was, he owned it ultimately, okay? And of course that's not true. All the natural resources we have, including gold and silver, were given to us by God. They are God's, they're his. So similar to the ground that the rich fool in that parable where it says that the ground caused growth or a bumper crop basically, in a similar way you see something here where, the, where Caesar claims ownership of something that is absolutely not his. It is God's to begin with. However, in spite of that, Caesar imprints his image and his inscription on it. But then when Jesus says that we should give to God what is God's, the insinuation here based on what, he, what Jesus is saying with the coin and the image is that the people of God are image bearers of God. Going back to Genesis 127, 
It says that we were made in the image of God. Every person was. We have characteristics. We reflect the characteristics of who God is and his character. We're, we're creative. We're compassionate. We are loving. There are all sorts of ways that we exemplify who God is and, and differentiate us from mere animals. And by virtue of that itself, there is profound value in who we've been created to be. Seneca Hills Bible Camp and Retreat Center is a hidden gem located just north of Pittsburgh in Venango County. Personally, when I attended their men's weekend, I was blown away by the beauty of the surroundings, the quality of the facilities, and the superiority of the cuisine. This is not your typical camp food, folks. Seneca Hills hosts year-round retreats and conferences, but their true passion is summer camp, where campers, both kids and adults, escape the everyday tyranny of screens and distractions and immerse themselves in 250 acres of God's gorgeous creation. Go to SenecaHills.org or call my good buddy, Executive Director Lyndon Fowler, to learn more about how Seneca Hills Bible Camp and Retreat Center can help you, your kids, or your business create unforgettable memories, meaningful friendships, and a deeper understanding of God's love. So going back to principle number two, created in the image of God, people are the most valuable assets worth infinitely more than any other capital. And I use that word specifically, capital, because it has broad meaning. Yes, it includes money, but it also includes hard assets or uh, technology or intellectual property. These are all reflective of capital. Capital has to do with our productive capabilities. And of course, people are the most valuable asset for the purpose of productivity. So that's one piece of the more profoundness of the meaning of what Jesus was saying. The second piece is that here's the crazy thing. So Jesus was about to reclaim and redeem his people through his death on the cross and the resurrection from the grave. So as people who bear God's image and we live in a corrupt, broken world, we ourselves are corrupt and broken and in need of a savior. And so Jesus goes to the cross to pay the penalty that we couldn't pay a very economic transaction, by the way. There's a reason why when Jesus says it is done or it is finished, that it's as if you, you stamped a debt, a, 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 vow, a voucher, a, a kind of a paper of a debt or contract as being paid in full. It's as if so, he, someone took your mortgage and a big stamp, big rubber stamp says paid in full. And you, you're no longer responsible for that debt anymore. That is what Jesus meant when he said it is finished. So it, very economic transaction. But he was about to do that. And he was about to redeem his people. So not just, so he was going to redeem his people who were made in the image of him. And then by virtue of them being saved, deposit his Holy Spirit into us to make us so much more than human. Instead, we are children adopted into the family of God. We are his children now. Okay. We are his sons and daughters and brothers and sisters of Christ and co-heirs with Jesus. And so not only as I said before, are we are all people created in the image of God and the most valuable assets worth infinitely more than any other capital, but Christians, and I've, I've talked about this before, go back to episode number five where I go into more detail about how we are actually God's money. We are the way by which God is transporting eternal, incalculable value through time and space and preserving that value in us and, and for us, along with us, for eternity. Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 through 6, it talks about the fact that God's people are his movable treasure. And basically that means money, because there's a differentiation between what's movable and portable treasure versus real estate or a home or a physical property. And so by virtue of the Holy Spirit that's been deposited inside of us, we are God's we are God's money. We are his store of value, his medium of exchange, and his unit of account. <laughs> and that's all the fruit of what Jesus did on the cross and through his resurrection. Truth at Work Executive Peer Advisory Groups are a life and business changing experience. Trust me, I've experienced it myself. It made such an impact on me that I stepped out to become a chapter president myself. 
At Truth at Work, we're dedicated to helping Christian business leaders who feel isolated and overwhelmed. Our community of like-minded peers are here to help leaders like you live out your faith in the marketplace and build your business on biblical principles. Christian business leaders are transformed through these peer advisory groups that apply biblical truth for living out our faith in all areas of life. If you'd like to learn more about Truth at Work, email me, Mike Hatch, at mhatch at truthatwork.org, or you can email my counterpart, Dave Hartman, at dhartman at truthatwork.org. So something to remember as a business owner is, number one, people in your business, your customers, your employees, your partners, your vendors, all of them were created in the image of God and have eternal value and should be treated as such. Secondly, if you have Christians who are working with you, that's even a step above. They are actually God's movable or portable treasure. It's where he has chosen to store the incalculable value of of the Holy Spirit. And so you could even think of Christians in your business as being seed that was sown into your business as an investment from God. So how does that change the way you think about the people you work with, the people that you hire, the people that you train and develop and lead? I think it should cause all of us to be way more intentional, way more careful, way more prayerful, and needing to be desperately dependent on God and his guidance. That's what I love about what Tamara in the interview we did Monday said about putting relationships over KPIs and that God is using her in a relational way, an eternally relational way, that hopefully eventually God, and I believe he will, will end up producing uh, profit for her and growing her business and, and hopefully giving her more reach and expanding the area of dominion in a sense that she has under the authority of the kingdom of God. Also, something I want to remind us of, I've mentioned this before, is just the self-sacrificial nature of our service as business owners and entrepreneurs. If you if you own a business, if you work with other people who've come under your umbrella, if you will, that is by virtue of you being a Christian, they're coming under the, the dominion of the kingdom of God. And so that absolutely obligates you to them in a certain way. And what I mean by that is it obligates us to be self-sacrificial. Like Christ led by example, we're called to be self-sacrificial in our service to others on behalf of God's kingdom purposes to be a blessing. Remember, from the very beginning, Genesis 12 where God calls Abram to leave Ur and go to a place that he's going to show him and he's going to expand him into a great nation and he's going to, through him, he's going to bless the entire world. Very similar thing is true with us as Christians, that God has deposited this Holy Spirit in us that is his very presence and he's going to take us and use that spirit to move us to influence and redeem the world. And he does this for the purpose of reclaiming and redeeming his image. So going back to Matthew chapter 22, when Jesus says to give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to give to God what is God's, we as Christian business owners play a role in that in a hugely significant way, profound way. All right, gang, so that was principle number two under the category of aligning with God's redemptive plan. And principle number two again, Just to revisit one last time, created in the image of God, people are the most valuable assets worth infinitely more than any other capital. Christians are the wealth or store of value in God's kingdom. Let's get to work!